This is the lecture number two on the Bayesian inference of epsilon machines. Um, what I'm doing here with Jim as a postdoc. And I'm going to start off um, just again with the overview of what we did sort of last time, which was from the basics of statistical inference, um, a very quick introduction to Bayesian inference. And I'll, I think I'll mention a few points on that again to try and get a better sense for people of what exactly is happening there. Um, and then we went through a couple of examples, biased coin, inferring transition probabilities, moved to unifuler HMM, and looked at the even odd process in particular. And we used the topology. We knew what the edges were. We knew what symbols they output. And so all we were doing here was inferring the transition probabilities. Um, and one of the important parts of that was that we also had to assume a start state to do this because if we assume a start state in a unifuler HMM, then there's a unique path through it, and that allowed us to count edges. And so that was an important thing that allowed us to connect sort of very traditional statistical inference to something where the states are hidden, and it's because we assume start states. Um, and so this was all for fixed topology, and now we're going to move into we want we have one data set and we have a whole bunch of different topologies. How do we decide which one's best? So that's today. And part of what we'll be doing is using a, an enumeration algorithm by Ben Johnson, one of Jim's grad students, on um, how to enumerate, in particular, topological epsilon machines. So that will be one type of candidate structures that we can look at. And so we'll do an example again with even odd process, but this time we won't assume that we actually know the structure. We'll figure it out from this library. Um, and then I'll show some plots that have sort of more data and uh, better ways of looking at uh, things from the golden mean even and the simple non-unifuler source, which of course we can't directly infer this because it's not unifuler, but we can still use unifuler representations to estimate these things. So that's part of the interest. This is a, an out-of-class example in terms of inference. And I'll end off with a um, more general out-of-class example and one of a non-stationary process, so kind of cautionary tales of if you deal with real data and you don't know what it's coming from, um, what might you expect and how much should you be worried. And again, I'll be doing coding examples and there is a Sage workbook up there that does all of these things, so most of the coding examples you can go and play around. There's, yeah, so there's two notebooks. There's one for the previous lecture and then there's a new one now that does all this stuff. So pretty much all the computation is available for you to play around with. Um, so this is the one slide uh, review of last time. And, and I guess talking with Jim afterwards, one of the things I wanted to sort of um, emphasize is this idea in Bayesian um, statistical inference of starting off with a prior distribution and going to a posterior distribution. And in the last lecture, we did this on two levels. So in this first one, we were inferring transition probabilities. And so we had a distribution over transition probabilities, assuming the start state and assuming a topology. But it wasn't informed by the data. We wrote down a likelihood. And sort of the combination of these two things are reweighted. And it gives us an updated distribution over parameters that now takes into account the data. And in particular, for this part here, because these parameters are transition probabilities, these are continuous parameters. We had um, a special form here called uh, a conjugate prior. So if you had a conjugate prior, it meant that in this case, we would have a beta distribution or a, a Dirichlet distribution. We would end up with a beta or a Dirichlet distribution over here. But these two things are very, very similar. Okay? And so it's always this kind of thing, where you're starting off with a prior distribution, and you're moving to posterior distribution. And the same kind of thing here, we did this extra level where we wanted to, after having the transition probabilities, we wanted to know what was the actual start state, because we weren't interested in that necessarily. We wanted to figure out what that was given the data. And it's the exact same thing here, where now we have the probability of each start state. And our prior there was to assume that each of the start states was equally probable. So if there's five states, it was one fifth a priori. But then we had the evidence that actually came from here. So there's these connections between the different levels. It goes from here to here. And that tells us how likely each of the start states is given the data. 
but there's always this process of a prior distribution to a posterior distribution. And here there's some model that's telling us how to evaluate different parameter settings. So that's the very, very high level. And this idea of updating distributions based on data. Okay. And the, the, the particulars of the mathematics are depend on what model you're looking at. We're looking at, you know, at uh, you know, hidden Markov models and Markov chain-like things. But you could do the exact same kind of thing for inferring the, the mean and the variance of a, of a Gaussian distribution, where you'd have priors and posteriors. But, and the mechanisms would be very, very similar. All right. So hopefully that is a little bit more clear. But I really encourage that if this is novel to you, actually just look at Wikipedia, <laughs> your Dirichlet distribution. Um, look at Bayes' theorem and just grind through the mathematics of one example, like by hand. So, so some of these things in particular for those conjugate priors like we have here, you can actually calculate these things and take a prior distribution, modify it with uh, a likelihood, and calculate them out. And it's a useful exercise. It's not always fun, but it's, it's useful and it's convincing, um, especially if it's unfamiliar. Okay, so we're going to infer structure now. And so one thing that I wanted to do was to sort of contrast what I'm going to be doing with what is more common, um, probably. Um, and you're more likely to have encountered this kind of thing. So this is very generally, um, and I'm, I'm sure there are exceptions, but often when people say that they're inferring hi hidden Markov models, they're usually assuming some sort of fixed topology that they've assumed. It's a certain number of states, certain number of connections, the outputs are of certain types. And they're often considering non-unifuelar topologies. So there isn't a unique start or a unique path given a start state through these things. And as a result, you end up with a whole class of algorithms that numerically optimize the transition probabilities to agree with the observed data. And so these are called expectation maximization algorithms like Baum Mulch. And this comes up in, in statistics all the time for when you have some sort of a hidden state thing that you're trying to infer. And here, it's really you kind of have, you have to optimize over all the possible paths, and there isn't a unique path for an observed data set. There's many, many paths, so there's this numerical optimization. But the main thing is that it's they are considering non-unifuel topologies, and they're usually assuming a single and fixed topology. Um, and so, what we're going to do differently is because we're interested in, in epsilon machines and epsilon machine-like things, we're restricting to unifuel hidden Markov models. So. We're going to only consider that those types, um, and we're going to use model comparison to infer topology. So we'll have a whole set of them. In this case, we'll be um, looking at, in most of the examples, on the order of 1,400 topologies, and say, given a data set, which of these is the most likely? Um, and we'll provide a distribution. We can take into account the uncertainty in the structure in the same way we did the uncertainty in the start state and the transition probabilities that we did last time. So the sampling that we did to estimate like entropy rates and CMU um, to get a mean and credible intervals, we could do the same thing for structure. And potentially we could consider this a, a different way of thinking about structural inference. Um, on another level, it, it's, I mean, it is very conventional Bayesian application of these days, ideas. It's, I've been doing basically just model comparison on various levels. And so the next thing is, what set of models should we use? And so I'm going to use one in particular, but um, it doesn't have to be this one. But it's certainly a good one, and especially if we're interested in, in Epsilon machines, it's a good place to start. It just has to be unifuelar HMMs can be fed into this. Um, so we're going to look at topological Epsilon machines, and I'll go through definitions in just a minute. But in, the motivation for this is that there was hard work by, by Ben Johnson in this paper here to figure out a fast way to calculate every one state, two state, three state, four state machine um, for a given alphabet size. And that's actually not such a trivial thing to do. So we're going to take advantage of this and be kind of brute force about it. Just say, we'll look at everything we can up to a certain number of states. Um, and so that will be our set of candidate topologies. Um, and really, we're just we're limited by time and computational resources. So um, one thing you'll see is that as you get more and more states, the number of topologies that are available grow very, very fast. And so you can only do this within limits. Um, so in the long run, having maybe 
more creative way to choose sets of models to look at would be a good thing. But this is a good place to start and, and quite interesting already. So definitions, um, again, a couple of these we saw from last time, but to get us all on the same page, um, finite state, edge labeled hidden Markov model as our set of states, a finite alphabet, and the set of symbol labeled uh, transition matrices, stuff that you're all familiar with from the class. And if we want the state to state transition matrix, we can sum over these things and get a T that's independent of the output symbols. We can further refine this to what a finite state epsilon machine is by the additional restrictions that they have to be unifiler. So for each state and each symbol, there's at most one outgoing edge from state sigma i to and has output symbol x. And again, for the inference, this is really, really critical. Like this is the reason I'm able to do the edge counting and why what I'm doing applies to the epsilon machine structures and not generally to hidden Markov models. Um, and then for an epsilon machine, of course, each state has to be probabilistically distinct. You know, there's some word that is, has different probabilities for each pair of states in the machine. Okay. And then something we didn't talk about last time is topological epsilon machines. And so part of the way that these are enumerated is to look at the topologies in a very particular way. And so the definition here is topological epsilon machine is a finite state epsilon machine where the transition probabilities for each state are equal on all outgoing edges. And so I gave just two examples here of how this creates restrictions on what types of topologies you'll see in this set. So one example here is this one. So the way that the probabilities are set is we have this state, and there's an edge going out this way, an edge going out that way. They have different symbols, so it's unifiler, but they're set equal to 1 half, 1 half. So that's each state is equal probable. <clears throat> here, there's only one, so it's set to probability 1. So this would be a valid topological epsilon machine. Whereas this one would not, because we have one half, one half going out here, and then one half, one half going out here, and these are not probabilistically distinct. So even though in inference, we're going to be sort of ignoring the transition probabilities and inferring them, the set of topological machine, topological epsilon machines in the, in the way that the enum enumeration algorithm works is a test for this. And so that's one thing that's important to take into account. So for example, if you have something that has a support for all words, and we're using topological epsilon machines to infer this, the only machine that's in there that has full support is a single state, 0, 1, for binary alphabet. So it will collapse down to that thing. There is nothing that is like a first order Markov chain. So you want, you want to add that. Um, and again, we don't have to use this set, but that's, that's what we're going to use for the first time. It's very structured. Um, and so even in this more restricted set, there's, the numbers grow pretty quickly. So this is one of the tables, or part of one of the tables from, from Ben's uh, paper. And it gives you a sense of, this is the number of states. So one state, two state, three state, four state. This is the number of edges. And the number up here is the total number with one state, total number with two states, three states, four states. And then it's divided out here by, there's for example, three states and three edges, there's two of them. Three states, four edges, there's 22 of them. And these are full alphabet, which means that these machines must produce both a zero and a one. So for example, this, the machine that has just a one edge and gives a one is not in here, things like that. So just in terms of the sheer numbers of candidate topologies, um, this is what you get for topological epsilon machines. Yeah? Can you repeat what you just said about yeah, so that's what, in terms of the numbers, that it means being a full alphabet um, topology, it means that there's not in this set. So that, for example, there's only one one state machine. It's the one that has a zero and one and comes back to that state. There's not a machine that has outputs of one and just, oh, so it's like just one. Rather what alphabet? Are we working strictly with binary? In this case, I'm going to be doing binary examples. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be, but yeah. yeah. So in this case, it's, um, but if it were more than that, like if we have three letters, um, you would, if it's a full alphabet, then you would still have to be, you know, would have to put out one, two, and three as but a symbol. But the numbers on there wouldn't change based on the Oh, no, no. Size. The numbers, the numbers, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. So the two means alphabet size two. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this gets much worse as the alphabet size gets bigger. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's the, the, the two n minus one pattern for the number of edges. Does that come about because you have to have the 
Right. So there's all these restrictions that you can't have. You have to have probabilistically distinct states when all the outgoing edges are equally probable. That puts lots of restrictions on what you can have there. Yeah. Okay. So is this that, and then um, something that we're kind of talking about, and I'm not going to belabor this, but I wanted to bring out this this idea that kind of the way that we're thinking about epsilon machines, and I think most of what you've done has been thinking about the history formulation of epsilon machines. And this is the idea that you have a process that determines the epsilon, stru epsilon machine structure through an equivalence relation. So you group equivalent histories if they have the same future morphs. And there's another way to think about this that's been um, employed by Nick Travers, who's finishing up his PhD now. And there's a whole series of papers that were related to synchronization and actually the equivalence between these two different uh, viewpoints and the other viewpoint is that a generator formulism for um, epsilon machines, and, and it turns things around, and epsilon machine defines the process that could be produced by the topology. So in a certain sense, this is, this is more the way to think about the inference that we're doing here, and that we're going to look at a, try and infer a bunch of generator epsilon machines that are consistent with the data that we've seen. We don't apply an equivalence relation or anything like that. It's going to be um, much more in the style of this way of thinking about epsilon machines. Okay. So how do we go? Um, so it, it's, it's Bayes' theorem again. And so, I mean, even the symbols all change, but it's the basic, the basic idea um, should be familiar at this point. And again, we're going from a prior, so we're going to have to specify a prior. We're going to choose our set of candidate models, which is a script M. And we're going to be using topological epsilon machines. Um, but you can choose whatever set you want. We have to have some sort of prior of MJ is going to be a particular member of that set. What is the probability of that a priori? And then there's going to have to be um, a likelihood-like term, which is what is the probability of that data given a particular topology. And really, we're using stuff from earlier on from the um, probability of the data given a single topology. So we actually calculated these things in the, in the previous lecture. And this value actually really doesn't depend on the set that we're considering. So we're writing it this way just so the patterns look similar, but really we've calculated this thing previously. And the idea, again, is that we want to update this prior to a posterior using these weights. And the normalization term, again, is basically just summing the numerator over all things. And so just like every instance of Bayes' theorem where the thing you're trying to infer is discrete sets of objects, you're doing this sum normalization term. The only time that we've done something more complicated is for the transition probabilities, where those are continuous parameters. And then we actually had to do integrals over multidimensional um, simplices. That is more complicated. This is, is pretty straightforward and very similar to lots of calculations already done where you have a probability and you're normalizing it based on some context. Okay, so what kind of prior will we choose? Um, and this is, this is just one prior. Um, I think it's, it's fairly effective, but I'm sure I could be convinced that there were other ways to, to do this. Um, what we're going to do is use a, a simple prior that has a single parameter. Um, in this case, it would be beta. And there's going to be an exponential penalty for some function of the model topology. So in this case, what I'm saying here of f of mi is the default in Campy, and in the code that you'll be able to play around with is just to count the number of states. And so there'll be an exponential penalty for the number of states, and it'll be weighted by this beta value that you set. Um, it could, you could make this the number of edges. It could be something else. Um, and I mean, we can also set this to zero if we want to. And then it's basically all the things are just equally likely, although there are some kind of Occam's razor's effects on the lower levels in terms of the number of transition probabilities and how many states that will naturally prefer one topology over another. Um, this is sort of an extra part. And actually, for the topological epsilon machines, this becomes important in, for very small data sets because there are examples of, frank, for example, there are periodic processes in there that will just have three states and they'll go 0, 1, 1. Um, that's a weird structure because we're not inferring transition probabilities. They're all probably one by definition. Its likelihood is one or zero. 
And so if, even if it isn't really a periodic process, you can have that pop out and be very, very probable um, for small data sets. And this can remove that aspect of it. So it will give some penalty for the fact that you're giving a three-state periodic process to something even though you only have 50 you know, uh, symbols worth of data. Um, this becomes less important as you get more and more data. But in particular, it's small data sizes. And this is often the case for priors. They're, they're much more important when they're small data. Um, and much less important when there's lots of data. But so this is one way to do it. And the idea, again, is to sort of start off with the simplest model that you can and let the data push it to something that actually um, can have high likelihood. All right, so what do we do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there a particular reason why you, you like, just assume, assume you can just pick, say, a, a six and do all possible labels and then just infer at probabilities and then, like, eliminate ones that are approximately zero? So, so, get, so, so also, instead, of, instead of doing an enumeration, you just, you just stick a really, just assume a really complicated one. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Manually look at right. Well, you can see that if it if you have a bunch of zeros in your transition probability. Sure, sure, sure. Is, yeah. Is is there just I don't know. Is there a benefit over enumerating topologies versus? Well, one is it? I mean, there is some there is some power to. I mean, one thing we'll find is that for all of the examples, in particular, when we get to G, the golden mean and the even and the SNS, that when we use this enumeration technique, there will be. Um, thousands of unifiedly representations that accept data at 100. And so what you end up getting representing these things will be, in the case of the golden mean and the even, you get the correct topology with really high probability, and these other ones with much, much less probability. But for SNS, that's not in the class at all. And so it's representing. So it, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I think it's not, it's not clear. I think there's some power to looking at the, the set. So. When you put a prior over, so you're talking about six states all connected to all. So all right. So yeah, that, your and prior we just, is all transitions could occur, two. right? And then we do but, what we did on Tuesday. But it turns out mm -hmm. there, there is this issue of the statistical significance of not having seen a transition, and the net result is it's very hard for these inference algorithms to actually completely turn off an edge. So there's actually a bias towards keeping a little bit of epsilon probability if you allow that to be in your prior. That, that, so, so, so the trade-off is to say we're going to step through topologies explicitly testing setting transition probabilities to zero, and that's really focusing more on the structural aspect. It's really the restriction, the restricted transitions that mean you're looking at differently structured processes, as opposed to some big multinomial process Markov chain over six states with small um, transition probabilities. Mm -hmm. so, so, so practically, the inference algorithm has a very hard time pushing probabilities to zero with finite data. By design, okay, so, so, it's, so, yeah. so that pushes you over to some class of processes where there are no restrictions. So it, that has a very strong bias towards unstructured processes. Yeah. So it's one of those you could start with some generic machine, run through it, get small value transition probabilities, enumerate. So you start with a big to machine, motivate a set, and now then it moves, sure. move back down. So yeah. like cutting out edges, cutting out yeah. states. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, any any creative way to come up with a, a, a constructive set is, is good. I mean. And certainly the transition probabilities will never be weeded to absolutely zero. I mean, they just sort of, they approach that because you have this, you know, posture. just wondering more like computationally, like, sure. is, is looking at all four state machines more computationally than it's kind of looking at a single, like six state with all edges, like US. No, I mean, it, so, I mean, all the, th the examples in terms of code, I mean, they'll run on, like, 30 seconds on, on your so, laptop. Yeah, so, but when you get, when you, if you really think that there's a 10 state machine or something, then enumeration becomes really, yeah. So, I mean, there is, there's a trade off at a certain point. But for, yeah. yeah. There were other questions or? Um, it seems like you, there, there are these uh, block diagonalization algorithms. Uh huh. To do what? Uh, I mean, where you can, I don't remember what. Some ways where you can take a huge matrix of you know data where you have information and then try and block diagonal 
and see if you can get kind of like submission or something. In terms of analyzing the structures that are left? Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I can't comment because I, so I don't. So one example of that yeah. is in, in networks. People are interested in community structure. And sure. Basically, there are various forms of competing concepts and algorithms for, say, for clustering a set of nodes in a network right. as a, quote, community. Yeah, so, so that kind of thing. Right. Sure. But again, these all suffer from being able to prune out things that really shouldn't be there. So, so the approach that Chris is talking about is really very complementary to this. And yeah. it's more focused on trying to see which structures by which we mean turning this edge completely off or turning that edge completely off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so you could start with a, you know, maybe you had data from a whole mean or an even process, and but you assume so four state all connected to that. If you do that, it's very hard to see that it's a two state with never see two zeros in a row. You won't get it, whereas this way will pick it up very quickly. Mm -hmm. You see, so it's, and I should say there's always this trade off in this, right? Yeah, right? All these algorithms, you give them infinite data, they'll do it right. So in a very kind of crude sense, a lot of the issue we're talking about here is just efficiency, data efficient, the use of the data efficiently, and can I get more interesting results in a smaller data sets? There's always this kind of trade-off, and mm -hmm. different kinds of computation help that to mm -hmm. get out of smaller data sets. Yeah. So. All right. Um, yeah. I mean, so these are all 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 good questions. I think that it's uh, yeah. Um, so what do we do with this posterior once we have it? Um, and again, um, we have a probability of each topology given the, the data and the set that we've considered, whatever set we've chosen. And this is a normalized thing. So there's a variety of things that we can do in terms of using that. And I think the way that I would tend to use it, but again, is more computationally intensive, is to use the whole posterior over all models. and. Um, I'll go through some algorithms of this, but we can quantify the uncertainty in structure as well as quantifying the uncertainty in start state and transition probabilities that we did in a previous lecture for an individual topology. Um, and then when we estimate things like H mu and C mu, we're taking into account uncertainty in structure, uncertainty in start state, uncertainty in um, transition probabilities. Um, and another way, which can be okay and sometimes might not be, and I'll show you some examples where that's the case. So like SNS data is one example where this is dangerous, whereas you just take a single, single topology that is the most probable in the posterior. And so if this topology has 99.9999% in the set, probably you're okay and will still reflect the uncertainty. But if the most probable is not very likely in the set you're considering, then you're really not capturing all the information that you have from the set. So this may not be a good substitution. So it's good to at least think about using the full set if you can get away with it. And that motivates two kind of pseudocode ways of thinking about how to sample from these. And this is if you want to take n sub s number of samples, you would sample a topology from the posterior over um, your set. Then given that particular topology, you would sample a start state. Given that specific start state, you would use this to sample a set of transition probabilities, which is effectively an, an epsilon machine. And then you can absolute, you can um, evaluate any um, function. So this would be like our H mu or C mu. Um, it could be transition probability. Well, transition probabilities don't make sense because they're attached to a particular thing. But functions, H mu and C mu. Um, and then you'll be able to estimate whatever quantity you want. And each of these posterior distributions come from the various levels that we did. These from the previous lecture, this from today. And then the other is to just use the single maximum a posteriori topology, where you take that single thing. There's no longer the sampling of topology, but you still could sample um, start state and transition probabilities to capture some of the uncertainty and evaluate your functions. Um, and even less refined is you could just take averages over these things and have sort of like one topology with an average transition probability averaged over the uncertainty of start states. Um, and so there is a method to do that in Campy, but be careful if you use it. <laughs> you know, word, word to the wise, it is at least to, good to, to think doing this is um, reasonable. Also, and just to emphasize the obvious, sample here is not the data. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. No, this is a sample of the function. So this is, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, so I'm, I mean, these are, these are all distributions. 
So it's like I sample a number from the Gaussian distribution. Here I'm sampling from the posterior. Like this is on the previous slide. I wouldn't even have thought that that would be good. So that's part of the point is that this is a distribution and it's normalized. So I can sample from that thing. Topologies. Um, and that's what I'm doing. So here I'm literally sampling. Give me a topology that's random random XOR length because it was highly probable. And then given that it's a random random XOR topology, sample a start state. But this start state depended upon the calculations we did in terms of how likely were the different start states given our particular data set. So this is one single data set in here. And all these, all these posterior distributions have been shaped by the single data set. So the samples are with respect to posterior distributions at each level. Yeah. So, so the, the function that you're calculating, is that related to the, the function that you used in your prior course? No, no. I, I, in this, I mean, this is a, a general, you want to estimate entry rate, or you want to estimate CME or any of the quantities that are related to the epsilon machines, you would, this would be the function that you have to give it an epsilon machine to, to, to calculate. And you need to sample all these things to get this particular setting for the transition probabilities. Um, and so it samples in that sense of structure, start state, then transition probabilities. Then you actually have a Mealy HMM or a recurrent epsilon machine in Campy, and you can say, give me the entry rate. And I'll give an example of this, so, which is exactly the next thing. So here's a practical example of doing this with something that we've already seen. So we're going to infer the structure of the even odd process. Um, and this is a straightforward application of, of what we've just been talking about. So again, I'm going to um, declare the uh, even odd process with slightly strange transition probabilities to just to make sure that it's not um, like the prior. So 0.1 and 0.9 and 0.3 and 0.7. Do that with a string. Use Campy to make an instant of it. And this is what it looks like. And so this is going to be what's going to be generating my single time series. And then I'm going to feed this to the algorithm and say, let's infer the structure, estimate entropy rate, CMU, these kinds of things. Um, and so this is exactly what you get to play with in the second um, lab on, on stage. Um, to do the inference, we have to do a couple of things. How, how big a data set? How big a data set? I will show. I mean, the, literally, this is all executed. Yeah, so yeah. I think I did 5,000 samples in this case. But so yeah, all the code is shown. Um, so first, I'm going to just actually look at the prior over these things and not even look at the data. So you import, you import the Bayesian um, stuff. And this particular library generator function is an interface to Ben's algorithm for enumerating structures. And so what this command does is says, give me 2 is the size of the alphabet, so all binary machines with 1, 2, 3, 4 states. And so that's assigned to this model set 1. And now I'm feeding this to model comparison. Engine. So last time we were doing a fur EM, it was for a single topology, but now this is a different class. And instead of feeding it a single topology, we're setting a whole set of topologies. Um, and then I set my beta, which is the penalty for um, structure size. And this little tag, verbose true, actually spits out this little summary so if you were to run this, it would say this as it's calculating the things. And so because I didn't feed it any data, notice I didn't generate any data, I didn't give it anything. It's, this is just the prior over these model structures. Um, and so that's what it says here. Is it says that beta is four. It says, well, there's 1,474 candidate machines. They're all possible because there's no data to eliminate any of them. A priori, they're all possible. Yeah? Uh, leaving the like, prior function yeah. thing the same, just use beta as a parameter, or is there any interesting dynamics that come from that, or is it pretty straightforward? No, I mean, I think that it, it, what you set this to, um, for example, influences whether or not you approach CMU, estimates of CMU as a function of data size length from above or below. So this particular value is, um, at least for binary machines, is, is good for approaching CMU from below. Um, and, and that's particularly important because um, the way the number of machines or candidates grows with size, so like you have many, many four state machines, so there's lots with high CMU. So if you don't, if you want to start from below, you have to have a higher penalty. Yeah. Um, but I mean, in, in the way that I'm applying it here, this is just something that you, you set, and it would be your inference would be conditioned on that. Um, if you want to add another level, you could actually you know, put a prior over that 
and let the data tell you which is the best beta, right? So I mean, this could be done endlessly, right? Yeah. So, um, okay, but so no no data here. Um, and here we're going to pull out. I'm using MAP. Usually that means maximum a posteriori. In this case, it's actually a priori because we haven't given any data. I'm just saying what is the most likely machine without any data given the prior that I've set. So that's what I do with this particular method. So I use the prior that I declared, and this is what, what I was saying, which pulls out the most likely and then just averages over the uncertainty at star state, which for a single state thing doesn't make any sense, but um, it gives the posteriors. And what it gives you back is the single state machine with 50-50, and that's because with a penalty for structure size, that's the most likely a priori. Um, when you feed data this, our prior distribution will be updated to a posterior distribution, and when we call these same things, it will be different because the data is restricting what class of things we can get. Okay. So that's what we do next. So yeah, here, I actually generate the data. Um, so I say 5,000 symbols. And then I set up my posterior. It looks very much like setting up my, my uh, prior. Um, again, I'm doing binary one, two, three, four state machines. And now when I set the posterior, I feed the data in. And I use beta equals four and reverse is true. And now when we run this, the output says, well, I considered all 1,474, but actually only 175 of them are possible. And what that means is that for the other ones that are not included, every start state in that topology was tried. It went somewhere through there, and it came to a node where it required a particular symbol, and it wasn't there. So it just said, so, but there are 175 <laughs> options of what could be um, viable topologies. And so then when we actually want to look at, again, just a single representation, because um, I will look at sort of estimating CMU and HMU in more general form, but we want a single representation of the most likely um, object. Again, we can get this, gives me the maximum, in this case, a posteriori topology, and it averages, gives me, averages over uncertainty in uh, start state, and gives me the posterior means of the transition probability. So it gives you something to look at. Um, I mean, in this case, even with 5,000 symbols, it's actually quite good. So this is the original data source, and this is if you run Campy, it will pop back at you if you just say draw this thing. Um, and so this actually is deceivingly good. I mean, 5,000 data points this is, is, is a fair amount of data. Um, but for that amount, you would be, it would not be unusual to see this to be 0.32 and this 0.68. And so there would be some kinds of fluctuations. But again, there are tools in here where you can actually sample over all that and so you can say that it's this particular value with this amount of uncertainty if you really want to get to that level and do it. But the point being is it, it captured the correct topology. Mm -hmm. we, we all agree and see that it's the same? <laughs> yeah. I guess the default in when you declare, even all, somehow it, it does this nicely and not this one. I don't muck with the, the, uh, the campy settings, but this is what you would get um, if you just ran it. Again. But, um, so it, do, it does a good job there. What if we want to do something that's closer to what we were doing last lecture, um, which was to estimate CMU and HMU? But now we're going to use the set of all topologies that we used. We're not going to just use one. But this code should look, if you look back at the previous lecture, will look exactly like what we were doing for a single known topology, except what our priors and posteriors are are now over whole sets of topologies. But they're these same methods that look um, it can be used in similar ways. But what's different here is, so we're going to do, again, what we did at the end of last lecture is we're going to use one loop to sample both from the prior and the posterior, and we're going to estimate h mu for the prior, c mu for the prior, h mu from the posterior, c mu from the posterior, each time through, and then add them to a list. But this prior now is over models, and this prior is over models. So now the machine that gets spit out each time could be different will be different some of the time. So when you calculate these things, CMU and HMU will change in ways you can't with a single fixed topology. So this is um, generate sample does the first algorithm that I was listening to you, which was 
sample from the posterior over model topologies, then sample a start state, then sample a set of transition probabilities, and that's what's returned here. So actually the node, the start state here, is what's the start state that was sampled, if you wanted it. Um, and so we're doing all of these at the same time, and we can, again, look at what these look like. And again, some of this is hopefully uh, for people who want to use this for um, projects, useful code, and that we're going to feed this then to histograms. Um, so our prior samples, posterior, are going to make blue and green and um, print them. In the worksheet uh, on Sage, I've also done the um, finding the mean from the samples and the, the credible intervals, just the way that we were doing before. I haven't, I don't have them in the slides here, but they're on the worksheet, so you can look at that, which will give you like a mean of NGP rate and a mean of CMU and, and kind of error bars or critical intervals. But if we just plot the, um, the samples, the blue is the prior, and the green is the posterior, and the true value, if you use the thing that we um, put in the beginning, is 0.438, and so it does a good job of, of um, capturing that. And the one thing that you should notice from the prior is that all of these structured processes, so the only one, the only process in the topological optimal machines that can actually create these really high entry rates is the single state, true edge thing. Most of them can't get higher, and we saw that last time with looking at just the even or, or the even odd process, that the maximum entry rate you could get was somewhere around 0.6. So the fact that a priori you see this broad uncertainty in, in entry rate is a function of the fact that that single state machine is in there. Um, the fact that the posterior is peaked like this means that the single state is not very likely anymore once you've fed the data to it. Um, so that's entropy rate. And again, I'll just go through these a little bit quicker. But um, same thing for CMU. Um, we're just going to take the samples that we created a couple samples of, uh, a couple of slides ago and look at what those look like. Um, and this is harder to see, and I'll show it in another way. But the um, CMU, because of the prior, when we know we pulled out the single state as the most probable thing. And so this big peak here is single state. It has no CMU. This little peak here is log two, so it's the two state machines. There's a little blip here that's the log base two of three, um, and you can see that better in some of the things that I'll showing up later, but um, there's this decay in sort of structure that's a function of how we set data and what set of models we looked at. But then the posterior pops out the one that is actually um, good after looking at the data um, in a statistical sense, and the true value is 1.84, Again, this ends up being a, a good approximation, and partially that's because um, it gets the right topology, right? <laughs> um, and the transition probabilities are defined well enough that CMU comes out um, good. Okay, um, and so again, we can look at CMU and HMU um, together, and I think this is a useful thing to do, and I've just been doing CMU and HMU, but that's for each of these samples. We look at the CMU and HMU that came from a particular machine for each one of those samples, and so the blue, again, is the prior, and the green, this little spot here, is the posterior. And so this whole line here is the single state machine with different transition probabilities. So when you're sampling from the prior, you're just seeing, oh, it's more likely to get the single state machine, and then it gets a certain set of, of uh, transition probabilities. And it basically all these samples are single state. And then this is C moves one, is two state machines, and these are different settings for the transition probabilities on sets of two state machines. And if this is only 2,000 samples, so to really fill this in, you need to do larger numbers of this. But you would see more and more of this. If I were to set beta to 0, you would see something that was not much here and a huge cloud a priori up here. So this is part of how you decide what beta to set. Um, and I'm taking the approach. I, I want structure to prove itself <laughs> through data. And that's basically what this beta setting is doing. Um, and the, the green is then, once the data is applied, lots of topologies are ruled out. We have probabilities for each of these topologies, and there's start states and transition probabilities. We sample all these things, and most likely it looks like it's probably just sampling this one structure most of the time over and over and over again. Um, that's not always the case, and we'll see some example of that in just a second. But it gets the entropy rate is 0.43, and 0.18 is the CMU. So the samples are focusing in on the right HMU-CMU combination. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, what is 
So if you had such data very low in the hand of the speed cloud, how do you expect the posterior would look? Would it be more spread? Or would it in this case with the limited samples and everything? Yeah, no, I, my guess is that it would be it would look really similar. Um, with partially, it's a function of how much data you provide to the posterior. So the fact that we gave it five thousand samples, my guess is that this would still be a posteriori very likely, and you this posterior would probably look very very similar. If I had only fed two hundred symbols to the algorithm, then they would be closer and they'd be much more diffuse. So it all it's a function of what models you set, how you set your prior, and then how much data you give the thing. So the yeah, the more data you give, the more likely the posterior is to be different from the prior. So yeah, that's a good question. And it's part of the reason that I like visualizing the prior and the posterior is to get a sense of, is this capturing the kinds of things that I want to actually capture? OK. So now just to give you an example of um, some of the processes that you, you know um, without the, the code, but just to give some, some figures. Um, and this is kind of this is going into the paper that Jim and I are working on. What I did is I, I took a single time series for each of these um, processes of length two to the seventeen, and then I analyzed substrings of that of length two to the i for i is zero one two. So length one, length two, length four, length things. So basically, I'm going to have this long time series, but I only look at the first symbol, then I look at the next two, then I look four, and and each time I'm say taking those four symbols and pushing it into the code. What does it give back to me? Then I do it again for length eight to just give a sense of the, the convergence. So partially that might actually get to sort of how the posterior changes as you get more and more data and really reflect on the earlier question. Um, and so in this case, um, I'm using all one to five state binary topological epsilon machines. So that ups it to 36,660. Um, I'm using beta again of four. And in this case, I'm sampling for each of these L's when I look at a substring, I'm, I'm sampling to estimate H mu and C mu 50,000 times. So I get a good sense of what the actual posterior looks like and, and prior. Um, and we would just want to look at the patterns of how this converges, in particular for different processes, what, what is happening. All right. So the first thing is to look at the prior. And so this kind of looks at what happens if you give different betas. So this is. I'm feeding no um, data to it, but I'm changing beta from 0 to 2 to 4. And the things to look at is, so these are the samples in C mu and H mu space. And then, for example, this is C mu this way. If you project that, marginalize it just on C mu, this is what the densities look like for those samples. And if you project this way, this is what the density of uh, H mu looks like. And so one thing that I have done also is notice I'm doing logs of one plus the probability, because some of these are quite different in scale, actually. And the plots just are really difficult to see. Um, so some of these differences are actually bigger. But you want to see certain patterns. So one is that for blue, what we already know, um, that's a big penalty for structure. A priori, we have a very big preference for C mu is equal to 0. That's that single state machine. And we see a peak at the two state machines, the three state machines. But if we decrease beta, that preference, then we still see a small peak at 0, a peak at 2, peak at 3. And now it's much more of the mass in terms of the average structure in C mu is up here. And with beta equals 0, not having any penalty, now it's really pushed up that way. And that's partially just because there's so many machines that have that number of states. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah, that's really, that's what's going on. Yeah. Um, so I mean. Partially, this, these differences are a function of the set that we chose, that we're being enumerative and we're choosing everything. So we want to have beta be careful um, in terms of, yeah, we just want to understand what the behavior is. Um, H mu is, is less um, unusual. And, and the one thing that you can see is that with beta equals 4, again, we get this single state. So you can get the high entropy rates because a single state machine is there. This is pretty much a function of that's very probable. Whereas if you don't have as much penalty, then you get this sort of peaked thing. If you just randomly sample all one to five state topological epsilon machines with certain amounts of penalty, you get this peak of entropy rates, taking into account uncertainty. Yeah. What was your penalty, like specifically again? I know like 
is an exponential, like it's it's an e to the minus beta times the number of states in okay, the machine. Just numbers. Number of states, yeah. In this case, it's just number of states. Um, yeah, and so you end up getting these two patterns where actually the difference between zero and two is not all that dramatic. With beta equals four, entry range, you really see the, the single state machine. Um, so that gives you a sense of what happens without any data, without any restrictions by actually observed things. Um, so let's feed it golden mean process data um, with beta equals four. So this is with beta equals four, and maybe I'll just go back quickly. So what we're comparing with the prior looks like the blue thing here. So it's a, very strongly this here, and then a little bit of stuff up here. This blue pattern and this blue pattern. So we're comparing that once we feed, feed the data. This was just to give you a sense of how the prior changed with different beta values. The actual examples with data, I'm, I'm now choosing this one, beta equals four. Um, and so um, in this case, um, L equals one is black. So basically, we just get the prior back. L equals 64 is um, the brown. And then L equals 16,384 is blue. Um, and the general pattern that one should see is um, that as you go from black to brown to blue is that you're converging in H mu and C mu space. Um, and actually, so these dashed lines are the correct values for these things, so correct values, correct values. So by 16,000 symbols, you've, um, in this case, certainly identified the, the golden mean structure and you're estimating C mu and H mu with quite a bit of accuracy. Um, and probably that's, that shouldn't be super surprising because the topology is in the set that we're considering. So it should do this. Um, so we can look more generally at the convergence kind of things. And so what I'm doing here is now looking at each of these substrings. And again, I was sampling and looking at the density as a function of length. So let me look at C mu in particular. Um, so this is a sort of a slice as you get from very small amounts of data to very large amounts of data. The vertical is the posterior distribution. There's a dashed line is the true value. And there's a little gray line that you may or may not be able to see that winds in here, which is the posterior mean for CMU. And so the fact that I used beta equals four means that the estimates are very small and they converge to the right thing. But it also shows that in particular for sample sizes that are not that large, this is a multi-peaked thing, and it's not at all clear for CMU. There's ambiguity in the structure. Um, and entry rate here, um, again, we have this broad distribution at very small data lengths, and as you get more and more, it converges to the right value. Um, and so this is the full data set, and that's basically the prior at the beginning, in both these cases, just looking at HMU and CMU. Um, and so this is an example of a very nicely converging thing where, so like to the 10 right here, this is only 1,000 symbols. You've already converged pretty quickly. Uh, so if you think about it converging as we add data, uh, explain the difference between having, like in this case, an uninterrupted stream of data as opposed to multiple shorter strings. Since in the, the case where it's it like makes a difference. Right, you have the added advantage of like being able to read out just the things that can't match that one. Right, right, yeah, definitely. It, ma it makes a difference. So if, um, if I do one long string, I basically only have to worry about inferring the start state and the hidden state path once. But I mean, if I'm really going to apply this to you know, data set one and data set two, and data set two is really sort of, there's some unknown amount of time and dynamics in between the two of them, I basically have to do the, the same thing over again. One thing I could do is do the first inference and get a posterior, make that my prior for the next data set, but I would still be inferring um, start states and all these kind of things. So, but you would, I mean, you would still get the benefit of increased amounts of data. But yeah, partially this is just one string of data. But yeah, so I mean, that is a real, you have to think about these things. Um, it's a good question. All right, so even process. Um, so, I mean, I guess one thing to say is that we're sort of going in increasing complexity. So the, the golden mean is a, the states really can, uh, correspond to something that is observable. It's a first order Markov chain with a restriction, basically. Like you could know that one state is really, there's no ambiguity, let's be clear about this. Um, 
you know, because you put a one going in here and a zero going in here, this could be identified with having seen a zero on this with a one. Um, even process really ends up being something that is an extra level of complexity because we no longer, there's whole groups of histories that these correspond to and there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. So in principle, this is much more complicated. And I mean, certainly in previous work that Jim and I did, we used just sort of first and second and third and fourth order Markov chains to infer things like this. And there you would see that you need higher and higher order Markov chains to approximate the even process as you give it more and more data because you can't be captured by a normal Markov chain, whereas the golden mean can be captured fairly effectively. Um, but now we're dealing with a, uh, with a model class that can capture it. And the same kind of coloring as we had for, for golden mean. And actually, this look, ends up looking really, really similar to the golden mean in, in all of the patterns. Um, again, uh, the true values are the, the dashed lines. This is um, entropy rate and C mu. Um, and again, for basically the prior, for 64 symbols and for 16,000. And um, I mean, I guess the, the, the details of, of the bumps in structure and, and these kind of things are slightly different because different sets of topologies are being ruled out. But overall, there's a strong convergence just like we had before. And again, this model topology is in the set we're considering, so we would expect it to converge. And, and it does by 16,000. Um, and if we look at these convergence plots of C mu and of H mu as a function again from prior to posterior and prior to posterior, you get a good convergence. Um, and I mean, one thing I like about these also is that I'm using, again, I'm using a single data set and I'm just looking at substrings. So I, I didn't do like average golden mean behavior or average even process behavior. I just gen literally generated two to the 17 symbols and then I chunked it, did the analysis, chunked it, did and all this. So you get a sense of this convergence, and you could do this with a real data set, right? You didn't, you didn't have to know what it is. I'm just wondering, the, kind of the, the more complicated behavior early on is it, is it because it has a higher Markov order in the, in the even process? Like in the, in the lower, the H mu, for H mu? Yeah. I don't know, is it more complicated? Let me pause. Yeah. A little bit, yeah, I mean, I'll get into sort of the number of accepting topology, but the details of exactly how these things are being weeded out, I think, is still something we're looking into. Um, but certainly there will be differences in terms of, um, I mean, they are different languages, but the support is different. Um, yeah, so it's, it, the convergence is potentially non-trivial. Um, in some ways, it's, it's amazing that they're as similar as they are. Um, so for the last one now, an example of something where um, SNS is non unifeeler so like I could not include this and feed it into my algorithm because it just can't find state paths. Um, it would it would get to this point where it would go. I don't know where to go, um, and that's where the other algorithms, like the expectation optimization, work because they're doing this optimization of a path. What is simple? <laughs> what does simple mean in terms yeah, of like, just in terms of definition? Yeah. Oh, okay, like not a. No, 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 no. no. Historical. Yeah. It's one of these sets of, of uh, typical uh, HMMs that we're looking at as, as data sources to consider how different things work. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, but this is interesting for us because this is not in the set of models that we're using. Um, so what does this thing do? Um, and so in this case, you can actually you can calculate the entropy rate. Um, so this dashed line actually is the entropy rate for SNS. Um, and surprisingly, this actually does get the entropy rate. Um, and this seems to be a pattern that um, happens in a lot of cases where even though the models that are in the set that we're using, um, the data source is not in there, it's still capturing the entropy rate. And of course, it can't capture the uh, structure and we see something extra complicated, and even for the large data sets, and this persists all the way out, we'll see that in a second, is that this, is, this really is two peaks in CMU. <laughs> um, and so when you actually look at the details, there's actually quite a few topologies that are all 
on the order of like five or eight percent probability. And so there's like a set of three that are all together and another set. Um, exactly why that happens, um, and partially it's, it's out of class. Um, but this is certainly non-trivial behavior, and we can really see that when we look at the convergence of these things. Uh, the behavior is much, much more complicated. Uh, I was thinking about it. Does that mean that maybe you can, you can create two epsilon machines and then create a, another one that samples between the two epsilon machines? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could elaborate on the model class, certainly, yeah. Um, I mean, I'll do an example at the end of lecture where I do exactly that, where I take a data set of one process and then just add another process on the end and see what you get. Um, but in this case, yeah, I mean, it's just completely out of model class. And the entropy rate actually, I mean, it doesn't look too different in terms of convergence from even and GM. Um, but where it's really, really different, and, and the more you look at the actual specifics of the details, it really is different, is that you have this very complicated increasing, increasing trend as a function of data length for C mu, and you end up here with this thing that's very multi-peaked. Um, and it isn't, again, this isn't just, even though there's two peaks, it's not two models. It's quite a few models that are actually making this up. Um, so, I mean, one, one interesting thing is, are there ways that we can, are things like this typical of out of class examples and, um, and certainly for um, cases where your out of class means that I have a 10 state unifuler HMM and I'm only using one to eight states, I'm not sure that you're going to get this kind of signal. So out of class I don't think necessarily um, will give these complicated things. It won't, I'm not sure that this will actually be a, a signature that out of class is happening. So that's I think a very not not simple <laughs> thing to figure out. Um, but in this case, it gives a very complicated behavior. And so the one thing that goes towards answering some of these kinds of things is um, just looking at the number of machines that accept the data as a function of data length. So this is starting off at the beginning. This is the starting amount of all 36,600 machines. And then this is the subsamples that we look at. And we're saying we give this data of length one or length four, or two to the four, um, how many machines will actually have a path for some start state? So there's, there's some start state where the machine will accept the data. It, it won't come to a node and have a symbol that it needs to produce and then just get stuck. And the common pattern here is for GM, for even, and for SMS is that in the beginning, of course, everything accepts. But then there's this bend down and by two to the six, you hit, hit this lower bound where the support is similar and the GM and the SNS are exactly the same. It's 6,225 of 36,600 will accept SNS data up to 2 to the 17 data. Whereas for even, there's less. And so, I mean, part of this is a function of, for in particular for well, we, even it's easy to see how you could take a three-state machine and bury a two-state even inside it. And so there would be, it would just rattle around in those two states. And then there's more elaborations with it. It's less clear how SNS does that, but certainly the fact the support of these two things is um, similar is, is means that this is very much course driven by just not so much the probabilities, but just the support of what's going on. So that's where... Uh, the interests of Ryan <laughs> in sort of automata and these kinds of things, I think, will come in, in handy trying to figure out what's common about the languages of these things related to the actual data source. Yeah. How many of these are just random coin flip processes? Because well, they, so that will, they, yeah. they would always be. Well, so that's the interesting thing is that, yeah, so allowed. because they're topological, there's only the single state, okay. two edge, so yeah. So it's not all, it's, that's the only coin flip in there. That's the only full support, yeah. Everything else has some sort of restrictions. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's, it's much less trivial than you might yeah. think, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, so interesting and to be investigated. That is one of the benefits of the top level machine. Well, right. They're very structurally have, full, you, you know, in a certain have, sense. Yeah. You don't have a bunch of points. Right, right, right. Yep, yep, yep. Um, OK, so then I wanted to just kind of uh, finish with a couple of fun examples. And again, these are in the Sage notebooks. Um, okay. 
of things that you might run into. So I just came up with a couple of things that <laughs> uh, might be problematic. Um, and so one is the true model topology, as we've already discussed, might not be in the set you're considering. And certainly that's true for S and S. But I'll do an example where we do the even and odd, which is a four-state machine, but only allow one to three-state machines. What do you get back? Um, that's an interesting thing to think about. Um, and then, what if it's non-stationary? Um, the, the transition probabilities, or even the structure, change over time, or if this is in space, for space, um, what does the resulting inference tell you? Um, and I guess one of the things is that when you get to dealing with real data, you want to, as much as possible, have secondary checks in terms of if you have a measurements from a real physical system, you come up with these models, you want to check your predictions, what does your model say about the physical system and make sure that these all make sense. And there may be ways that are, don't come out of the statistical modeling to rule out particular kinds of things. And those then can be implemented as reducing your set of candidate models or restrictions in terms of the priors that you're setting, all these kinds of things. But just two examples of what could happen. Um, so the first is just not enough states in, in the set. So, so the code, again, is, is the same thing, uh, except now we only have one, two, and three state topologies. And we're going to give it the even odd data that we generated before. So it's exactly the same data we did uh, before. But we now don't have the, the correct topology in there. Otherwise, we're using beta equals four again. And now when we run it, we see that now there's only 86 topologies in the one to three, and 10 are possible. And again, we pull out what is the most likely one. Um, and again, most likely in an average event over start state and transition probabilities. You end up getting something that looks like this. So true topology that generated the data with the right things. This is the best model in the one to three states. And this is actually, I think when you look at the notebooks I was playing around with it this morning, this is 99% probable in the set that you've considered. So that doesn't mean it's, when it's really, the posterior probability is high, it doesn't mean it's the right model necessarily. It means it's the most probable in the set you've considered given the data you've provided. So that's kind of the lesson I'm trying to push here. Yeah. So, so if you were to run it compared to what the probability is when you do one, two, three, four, mm -hmm. how does that compare? Like, what's the probability of that? You have the same amount of data Oh, I think that in terms of the, the correct topology in that set versus this one, that one's also high, um, but I think less convincing. Partially, there's more options for that length, but I mean, it's, it's, it's high. Um, you can check on the notebooks, actually. It's really easy to print it out, so I don't, it, I'm sure it was not 99 odd percent, I think, for the other one as well. Um, but I mean, there's certain things here where somehow there's certain elements of this part here that are averaging over aspects here. I mean, you can see the 0.3 and the 1 and the 0.7. So you can see it capturing particular parts of the process, but somehow it's averaging over other parts of this. And so certainly the data that was generated by, generated by this could be generated by this, and with similar probabilities, probably. But I mean, yeah, it's interesting to see how different they are. Yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, pretty close because right. if you look at B feeding into A, A there's a loop there, mm -hmm. and you get rid of that loop. Like, you just skip that step and just feed back into, like, zero, which would be, I mean, mm -hmm. in my mind, what would be A. Mm -hmm. So, I mean... Yeah, I mean, they, they should, it should be really, really similar. Like, yeah. is that loop, I mean, the loop's relevant, but it's just an extra step, because you know you're going to end up back there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this, this is the best that the set of models that we gave could do. But if you give, you include the correct topology, we'll give back the thing, and it sees it as... What happens if you do two-state? Um... That ends up only being, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, actually. But you could, you could try it. It's really easy. It'll take two seconds of computer time. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it, it ends up being this kind of averaging over. I mean, it's, it's describing the statistics on some sort of average sense. And I think that also will be shown in the next example, though. Yeah. Question, yeah. So notice that it looks like there's a really small probability of getting a single one after a zero in the half loop variable. In the real one? In the, in the inferred one. In the inferred one. one. Yeah. But so I was wondering if maybe you always kind of make some sacrifice like that, like some general 
thing always gets kind of thrown out. It looks like it really does really bad fat look good at everything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, almost inevitably, it has to do something like that. If it's not the right structure. It's going to, I mean, the fact that we get this structure back just means that there was a path for some start state for data that comes from this thing to go through here. And if you want to, like, you can go in and you can look and see which of these possible start states were possible um, and what their probabilities were and all these kinds of things. So, yeah, I don't, I, there's a lot of interesting things to be thought about this, I think. And another question, too. Yeah. Um, so, so it seems like there's a trade-off, right? If you have a binary string um, with this particular machine, uh -huh. or if you have like a three-word, or not binary, a binary alphabet, and then you have a three-word right. alphabet, uh -huh. where your third word is actually one-one or something, right? Uh, uh -huh. Because it seems like you've got that one loop between C and D. Um, oh, I see. Where you've got just, it's, it's an extra word, basically, one-one. And if you assume that, right, if you assume like a ternary alphabet, uh, one, would you run faster? Would this algorithm one, run faster? Um, and or two, would you uh, you be able to capture that with a three state system or something, right? Yeah. Huh. yeah. yeah. Right. So, I mean, I think that. Yeah. Yeah. Right, your string is still binary string. So, I mean, you could do all kinds of weird things with this. I mean, I could actually take a binary time series and use a library generator for all alphabets, for the alphabet of size three, which include one and two and three. Um, and there would be lots of machines that would accept that, and they would only go on the zero one edges, um, and it would just not use all these kind of things. I think that it's like when you know what the answer is, and you have an answer, I mean, it, there's, it's, e it's easy to engineer after the fact how you could do this better, but part of the point that I'm making here is that if you, if you really didn't know that this was the true source, and for whatever reason, we could only use one to three state machines. We were just limited by our computer power. This would come back, and it would be really the most probable. Um, so it's just like the words of warnings. It's it's I know <laughs> some of the, some of the other postdocs like to call this Bayesian magic, but I don't think it's magic. I mean, it's really really straightforward and like very empirical. It's it does the best it can with the data you've given and the set of models. So like with your uh, single unit source that captures h right. as well. Right. Which, is that just kind of, kind of general because because it is, this is encoding your, you can calculate h mu from your right. time Right, right, yeah. Right. Less model dependent. Less model sense. dependent. Yeah. So, yeah. so in that sense, like yeah. h mu or the things that don't come up on the actual states are right. more reliable from your inflation. Very likely, yeah. And yeah. I mean, I can't answer with definiteness, but I guess I think that's very likely. <laughs> State right. Then it really depends on that. Really depends yeah. On yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. That's kind of more of a general question. Mm -hmm. I mean, can, you can't kind of define a metric, right? Some sort of like timing distance or something between, between machines. Between processes. Between processes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, like, would you be able to compare, like, the, uh, I don't want to call it a timing distance, but between the strings that it's generated from the inverse quality and the proof quality, right. can, you, can you get a distance from that? I mean, there are a variety of ways of doing that. I mean, my, my most naive thought would be initially to just sort of, I mean, you could look at the, the distribution of words, I mean, or the support first. So look at the support of all future words of length 10. Um, and then there'd be a more refined thing of the probabilities. So you could look at some sort of relative entropy. And then others, maybe, I don't know. This, this is a long standing problem that's still open. Yeah. Is as clean as you'd like it to be, and having this geometry in the space of processes. I think you worked on that last year's class, so mm -hmm. um, but you know, the smiling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's a good question. Excellent for question. My final yeah. Project, yeah, yeah. Still work out. Yeah. I mean, an extra challenging thing is, though, is that I mean, you could think about doing this in the inference context of if you know the data source and you have an inferred thing of measuring this, but when you don't have the true thing, right. then it's unclear. You have to come up with some sort of secondary tests of this. Um, so let's see. Yes, not that much more time. So just a quick last example of something that I'm calling non-stationary, but a very kind of trivial but interesting, I think, at least to go through. And so all I do for this one is I create the golden mean topology, and I create the even topology, and then 
The first 4,000 symbols are the golden mean. The second 6,000 symbols are the even process, just tacked right on. <laughs> so it just changes topologies in midstream. <laughs> um, and so I only do part of this, but what you would typically do when you have a data set is just let's take all the data at once and let's see what we get. Um, and so in this case, I just I used one to three state machines. Um, you could use one to four or one to five. Um, I give it that data. Again, I use beta equals four that we've already seen. And in this case, I run 86 machines possible, but only three accept the data. And so again, we pull, pull out the best one and average over start state and transition probability uncertainty. And we get something that looks like this. <laughs> so the one thing that's interesting, I mean, this accepts that data set. There is a path through there. And you can definitely see elements of both processes in this. Yeah, I mean, it is definitely even. Yeah. <laughs> but so, um, I mean, part of the reason that, that I was thinking about Yeah. 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 So one, one thing that this, and this is the, actually the last slide, but I mean, one of the things that this motivates is that if you have a data series and the underlying assumptions in this model is that it's a, it's a static structure, the transition probability is not changing as a function of your time series, that may not be true in what you're dealing with. So one way to get around this kind of thing would be to actually chunk up the data and look at the first 4,000, then the next 4,000, the next 4,000. And so I've done this, and actually what you'll get in that case is you'll get golden mean, golden mean, golden mean. When you hit a part that's overlapping, you get this back. Then you get to even, and it becomes even, 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 even. But there, there is then this question of um, if those changes are really quick, that's much more complicated. Um, and so, I mean, you can at least make these kinds of these tests. Um, in the notebook, I have this thing where I actually print out the, in, the hidden state paths as a function of the time series that's in the notebook when you look on Sage. So you can see that actually. Um, there's a difference, like zero only happens in the golden mean uh, part of the data set, as far as I can tell. And then it basically rattles around here. So there's a different use of states as a function of where you are in the time series. So yeah, fun things to think about. <laughs>